So, thank you all for being here, and yeah, like everyone else has said, thank you very much, Gita Minus, for inviting me to this workshop um, and for all the organization. It's especially nice to present the topic I want to discuss today um, here because it's work I started back when I was a postdoc funded by the Alexander von Humboldt um, Foundation, and we finally managed to get it accepted a couple weeks ago, so it's a nice way to kind of tie up that part of my life. Um, yeah, so what I would like to tell you about today are some um, interesting approaches we are trying to develop uh, in the area of synthetic quantum matter having to do with Rydberg physics. So um, before diving into all that, of course, um, we should talk about Rydberg atoms a little bit. Many of you are very familiar with these, and Tillman already introduced these. In particular, the two things that um, you really need to know for the rest of the, the talk are um, exactly as Tillman said, that the Rydberg spectrum um, for atoms other than hydrogen really splits into two sections. So all the states with low angular momentum, they really feel the effects, so the so-called quantum defect here in the Rydberg formula. Um, they feel the effects of the residual electrons and um, complicated physics around the core of the atom, and they pick up this quantum defect which shifts their energies away from the hydrogen values, makes them non-degenerate and um, distinguishable. Whereas as soon as you get to high enough angular momentum, the centrifugal barrier keeps the electron away from the core of the atom, and you, you um, regain this SO4 symmetry of the hydrogen atom. So for um, high enough principal quantum number, you end up getting n squared, um, or nearly n squared, degenerate states. And this really is an important distinction um, that we'll use when talking about Rydberg polarons or Rydberg composites. The other thing, of course, is that Rydberg atoms are very large. They get larger like the square of the principal quantum number, and this means that their electron really wanders a distance comparable to um, typical distances in ultra-cold gases. Okay, so if I say that I want to use Rydberg atoms to study quantum materials, um, the typical reaction to this or the typical idea that people have nowadays is to take a bunch of Rydberg atoms, put them in optical tweezers, use their long-range interactions or the Rydberg blockade to study interesting uh, physics as has been pioneered by the Lucan group, the Brawa group, and nowadays many, many others are doing this. But I want to explore a different direction with you all today using ground state atoms within the orbit of the Rydberg atom to do similar types of things as people do with many Rydberg atoms. Um, and so this introduces basically the idea of a Rydberg molecule, which probably many of you have heard about as well. And this, of course, was um, first observed in Tillman's group now about 15 years ago. So to get a Rydberg molecule, you need two ingredients. One is, of course, the Rydberg atom that we just discussed. And the other, at least to first order, is just the simple Fermi pseudo potential that says that a ground state atom within the orbit of the Rydberg electron um, feels a potential that's basically determined just by this contact term of the electron scattering off of the atom and the S-wave electron atom scattering length. And with these two things together, one can get Rydberg molecules. And what's really important is, again, this distinction between these typical quantum defect-shifted states that are not degenerate and all these highly degenerate manifolds of the Rydberg atom. So if you take just one of these states that has a quantum defect, then this interaction potential that you get between the Rydberg atom and the ground state atom basically mirrors your Rydberg wave function. So this is a very long-range interaction. It's typically quite shallow, tens or hundreds of megahertz deep, and oscillatory like this. And crucially, the interaction of the ground state atom with the Rydberg atom is not strong enough to really change the electronic state of the Rydberg atom. So as you kind of see here, we put a ground state atom in, and the Rydberg atom looks the same. It just gets a small energy shift that traps these two together. And this is going to be the setup when we talk in a couple minutes about Rydberg polarons, electronic states that don't change when you add more and more atoms. On the other hand, when you look at these states living in the degenerate manifold of the Rydberg atom, now you have the possibility to really mix together tons of angular momentum to really try and park the electron right on top of this ground state atom and um, create a much stronger interaction. And these are these so-called trilobite molecules, as you can kind of see from this picture here. Basically, you hybridize all your electronic orbitals together, forming a similarly long-range but much deeper potential, and one where, as you can see, the Rydberg wave function looks nothing like all the um, 
Rydberg wave functions you're used to seeing. So this is, of course, a, a huge mixture of all these n squared degenerate L and M levels. And what's important about this, and this will be the crucial component of these Rydberg composites, is that this wave function now will change dramatically if we add a second or a third or a fourth ground state down to the system, because now we can similarly rearrange all these degenerate levels to try and maximize the electrons overlap with these atoms. And so basically, this gives us two different ways to view quantum matter, starting with these two different classes of Rydberg molecules. So in the first case, which I'll mostly just um, show in uh, rather briefly, because it's still somewhat preliminary work, and we're trying to figure out what all is going on, um, you have the case where you can add many, many ground state atoms to a single Rydberg atom with this constraint that it's not changing its electronic state. And this gives some interesting insights into polaron or quantum impurity physics. And what's nice there is we can really take this simple electron dynamics and use that as the platform to study really complex many-body physics of all these other atoms interacting with it, for example, in a BEC. Um, and then the second part for these Rydberg composites, um, I'll show you how we can study Anderson localization in this type of system, where now we take the opposite approach. We consider the ground state atoms as fixed, or rather simple, maybe held in tweezers or an optical lattice or something, and look now at how the electron responds to their presence and how you can study interesting physics in that system. Okay. So here's the polaron page. Um, so for those of you familiar with polarons, this Hamiltonian will be immediately recognizable. Also, if you're at Christoph's talk this morning, so we have here the um, kinetic energy of the impurity, kinetic energy of the bath particles, and the interaction between the impurity and the bath. And for simplicity, we take here just an ideal BEC with no interactions between the um, bosons, which is a pretty good approximation for a lot of qualitative comparisons. And um, like was mentioned earlier this morning, in the typical case that has been studied really um, in a tremendous amount of papers in the last 10 years or so, one considers just short-range interactions. So you could take, for example, a BEC, flip one of the atoms into a different hyperfine level with RF spectroscopy, and use a Feshbach resonance to really tune this electron, or sorry, this atom impurity scattering length in the bath. And you, people use, again, this type of Fermi pseudopotential, but which now, if, as you see, depends on the atom impurity scattering length and the atomic mass um, to look at how um, polarons form in a BEC. And if we consider instead a Rydberg impurity, a lot of the physics looks kind of similar. We again have an interaction between our impurity and the atoms, which depends on a scattering length, but now it's the electron atom scattering length. Depends on a mass, now the electron mass, and crucially, instead of this delta function, now it depends, like we saw with the molecules, on this long-range Rydberg wave function. So what does this do? Well, it depends on the regime you're looking at. So what I'm showing here is the absorption spectrum of a Rydberg impurity in an ideal BEC as a function, basically, of the depth of the potential, um, which is not a knob that you can tune in the experiment because you can't really change this electron atom scattering length, but it's a good way for us theoretically to understand what's going on. And you can sort of see how you would tune this by changing the principal qualm number if you're interested later. Um, but basically what we wanted to compare is what you get from this type of absorption spectrum and how it compares with the very well understood polaron case. For example, like in this absorption spectrum taken from this paper. And um, using the magic of PowerPoint, I can reverse that so that we can really do a one-to-one -one comparison between these. And um, you see here basically this uh, attractive polaron branch here, which is mirrored in the Rydberg case. Here the Rydberg bath particle, or the atom Rydberg uh, scattering length, goes through a resonance as you make the electron atom scattering length um, deeper. And that parallels what happens in the typical ultra-cold atom case, where now on the other side of the resonance you see this uh, repulsive polaron forming, and we see the exact same thing happening here in the Rydberg case. And one can predict the um, positions of these curves very well using the typical pseudopotential formula, where essentially you see the bath particles, they look at the Rydberg atom from the outside and see that they can scatter off of it with a large scattering length, but they don't really probe the inside yet. And a lot of that's because we're looking at rather low densities for this example. Other features that you see in these pictures that are quite important are these red dashed lines covering these uh, features. These are uh, what are called many-body bound states in the literature. And these basically form when you take your delta function interaction between the atom and impurity, 
and this has one bound state, and that's what you see here. And then as you bring in more and more atoms, you combine two, three, four atoms to your impurity, and that's what continues down here. These, of course, are all shifted by the presence of the polaron, which is why their curves um, follow the resonance like this, but it's all very well understood. And we see exactly the same type of physics here in the Rydberg case. If you looked at just the bound state of the Rydberg molecule without including any of the BEC physics, you would follow this dashed white line, but instead what you see in this absorption spectrum is really this strong feature here that follows a shifted molecular resonance. Now, an additional curve that I've plotted here is this green line, which is if you take a different mean field approximation than the typical one for contact potential, and now really put in the Rydberg wave function and calculate the mean field shift. If you do this, you get this um, linear um, curve here, which as you see agrees very well in the very weak scattering limit, because basically it's the Born approximation of your actual scattering length. And as you can kind of see here, this curve seems to better fit this type of feature here, where you start piling all these many body bound state resonances together into a sort of continuum here. To explore this further, we just start increasing the density, getting more towards a realistic experimental scenario. And we see, okay, there are many, many more molecular lines here, many of these so-called many body bound states forming. And they start really clustering around this mean field result until finally down the road, you end up getting um, basically a Gaussian shaped profile that um, the peak of which follows this formula, which um, if you're an expert in this, you would recognize as the original Fermi um, density shift that you get in this system. And um, basically our, so again, somewhat preliminary conclusions from this are that Rydberg uh, impurities in a BEC are a really nice environment for exploring this type of many body bound state physics because that's exactly what um, you start seeing at typical BEC densities and typical uh, Rydberg potential strengths. And that's, of course, already be, uh, been observed um, most clearly in the strontium experiments of Tom Killian, but I think also in Tillman's experiments as well, just with more complications because rubidium's a bit more annoying. Um, and what we're looking at now is how to really try and probe this polaron regime to really see if you can see a true Rydberg polaron, because um, what has in the past been described really as Rydberg polarons, we would claim are really um, perfect um, examples of this many body bound state formation. Okay, now we change gears dramatically to talk about Rydberg composites. So remember, now we're going from a simple electronic state to a complicated electronic state, and now we're getting rid of all the many-body physics of this BEC and considering our ground state atoms as really held in place within the Rydberg orbit. And what I'd like to convince you of is that one can take this Rydberg composite Hamiltonian, which is just the Rydberg atom, plus all these Fermi pseudopotentials at all these ground state atoms, and we can map this directly to a type-binding Hamiltonian. And by doing so, we can um, think about doing things like studying a thermodynamic limit using a single Rydberg atom perturbed by ground state atoms. So how does this work? Let's look again at this Hamiltonian. You see that this box in blue, this gives just the typical Rydberg spectrum, where we're really going to utilize this SO4 symmetry of the hydrogen atom to take advantage of this massive density of states available um, at these different degenerate levels. If you now look at the effect of including this term, so including our electron scattering off of all these ground state atoms, you would see that a density of states gets kicked away from this degenerate level. So for a single perturber, this would be this trilobite potential curve that pops out. And for many perturbers, you see as many uh, states shifted away as you have perturbers, so as many as m. And the more you put in, the higher your principal quantum number gets, uh, the more this um, series of kicked out states starts to resemble a density of states that might be something interesting to look at. And um, how can we really make this connection clear? Well, we do some very straightforward mathematics. We just look at the effect of this perturbation um, on this degenerate subspace. So again, this SO4 symmetry of the hydrogen atom is really crucial for what we want to do here. And that's what um, ends up making this direct mapping between the type binding Hamiltonian and our Rydberg Hamiltonian work. So if we look at just the matrix elements of this perturbation in this degenerate manifold, and we um, put in this rectangular matrix um, with the Rydberg wave functions, just to simplify the math a bit, we see that our Hamiltonian is just a sum of individual um, separable Hamiltonians using this um, rectangular matrix W. And 
if you then look at the eigenvalue problem that we're trying to solve to figure out what are these shifted states, you see that um, the eigenspectrum is exactly the same whether or not you compute it using HII prime or this transform matrix HQQ prime, which you can get by using a more Penrose left inverse um, to basically swap these two Ws exactly like this. And now this looks just like a kind of trivial switching of Ws, but this has a really important implication that now we have a matrix whose dimension is M. So this now starts to really resemble a type binding Hamiltonian where its matrix elements will tell us how our fictitious particle here hops from perturber to perturber. And we can get this directly through this mapping. It'll have the exact same eigenvalues as our original Rydberg atom does. And this is more than just math, because if you now look into what creates these hopping terms, you see that it's, again, these trilobite molecules coming out. So if you want to compute VQ, Q prime, you simply take the trilobite going to atom Q, and you figure out how big is its amplitude at atom Q, Q prime. So just by looking at these trilobite functions, you can see what are your matrix elements going to be. Are they going to be large? Is the on-site potential going to be large? Are there atoms to which you don't hop at all, et cetera? So, this means that now we can really think about designing a type of Rydberg composite by placing our ground state atoms in the correct positions to realize whatever type binding Hamiltonian we're interested in. So let's use the magic of tweezer arrays to say that you can simply surround your Rydberg atom by um, a ring of ground state atoms. And everything I showed is quite generic. You don't have to do a ring, but it, it makes for the much um, a much simpler analysis and design of things. So for example, if we put these atoms in a ring around the, ground, uh, the Rydberg atom and look at this trilobite wave function, we see that for a big enough ring, we essentially just have nearest neighbor hopping. The trilobite only overlaps its neighbors, and this gives us a really nice type binding Hamiltonian to try and study. And of course, thinking about a potential experimental realization, although I hope no one asks about it because it would be very, very difficult, um, but if you did try to do it, of course, you wouldn't be able to position these atoms perfectly. So instead of getting these beautiful extended eigenstates of your Rydberg atom, you would end up getting things that look much more localized because you should have disorder in the positions of these atoms. So this immediately brings up the idea of studying Anderson localization in this type of system. To do this carefully, of course, we have to really be able to establish a thermodynamic limit. Because of course, if we put in strong enough disorder, the electron will localize on different sites. But to really make a strict claim about Anderson localization, we need to be able to take an infinite size system at infinitesimal disorder and show that every eigenstate should localize. And what's beautiful about Rydberg atoms, at least in theory, is that we have infinitely many energy levels we can go to. So we really can keep making n larger, keep making m, the number of perturbers larger, and explore theoretically if this can support a well-defined thermodynamic limit. To do this, uh, we need to do um, some scaling laws quite carefully, because if you just, for example, make n larger, then you'd find that these matrix elements start to vary dramatically, and you wouldn't ever be able to reach a well-defined limit. Likewise, if you just increase the number of perturbers. And uh, through a lot of effort, we eventually found that for this specific ring size, if you really scale the number of ground state atoms with your principal qualm number like this, then you get matrix elements that are invariant up to an overall scale factor on n or m. So as you see here, their on-site potentials really for n30, 250, 500, really are sitting at the same value, and these hopping terms are sitting at the same value. So this means we can increase our system size and really go to a thermodynamic limit safely. And of course, to double check this, one should check the energy eigenstates, which you see fit perfectly all on one curve when just scaled by the principal quantum number to this rather unusual power. Um, and of course, as you increase the number of um, perturbers and your Rydberg um, state high enough, this eventually really starts to fall on the typical band that you would get from just solving this type binding Hamiltonian. And if we go now to this disordered case by adding in some perturbations to our atoms, we see that this also doesn't disrupt our system too much because we're able to scale the disorder so that this also reaches the thermodynamic limit correctly. OK, so now we see that we can do a thermodynamic limit. We can add disorder. Now we need to see if we really get Anderson localization. And of course, by eye, it looks kind of good. If we have extended states, we can really discriminate them from localized states. 
but we use this normalized participation measure ratio. Uh, normalized participation ratio measure to really quantify this, which um, for an extended state should be about two-thirds, and the more we localize, the more this goes to one over the system size. And now this is the crucial figure that I'd like to essentially end with. So here we take our Rydberg composite. We fix an overall disorder strength, so basically the amount we let the, the atoms move. Um, and we just increase the principal quantum number and the number of perturbers in sync so that we approach this well-defined thermodynamic limit. And as you see, this participation ratio drops from in the small system size case to supporting a lot of local, uh, sorry, extended states, and it just continually decreases as we get to very realistic quantum numbers like 10 to the 5. Um, this continues to drop more and more until we really see that every single eigenstate in our system is localizing. And of course, there are something like 70 years of Anderson localization papers that would tell us that this has to be the case because it's a type binding Hamiltonian with the nearest neighbor hopping in one dimension. This has to work. If you're interested, you can check out uh, the paper to see what else you can do with this because, of course, type binding Hamiltonian with nearest neighbor hopping is kind of boring. And if you go to smaller ring sizes, you can see interesting things like uh, hopping, which more or less goes like a sync function that eventually dies off at some point, giving rise to things kind of like mobility edges, at least at finite sizes, or cases where you really have all-to-all -all coupling, but with a dominant coupling to your opposite neighbor. And with that, I'd like to conclude, uh, thank my co-authors on the Rydberg Composites, Jan Michael Rost and Alex Eisfeld, um, my PhD student, Eileen Durst, who is working on the Polaron problem, and all of you for listening. So thank you very much for a nice presentation. Do we have any questions from the audience? Okay, <laughs> we have Tilman Pau is very active. <laughs> thank you. I, mean, I have a question. I mean, about the experimental signature of the composites. I mean, mm -hmm. if you go back, do you, you is there a spectroscopic signature that you would uh, suggest? Uh, yeah, this is a good question, a tough question. So spectroscopically, I think it would be difficult, especially in this regime where really you would want, I mean, essentially our, our goal here is to simulate something that looks like a band. So yeah. it would be hard to really resolve individual levels. And maybe you could try to really resolve this band by doing enough spectroscopy. This I'm, I'm not completely sure. Um, the other thing that would be interesting to look at would be um, to really do things like probing dipole moments. If you are able to just sort of try and populate as many of these potentially localized states as, as you can, and then measure something like a dipole moment, or really um, try and kick away the electron and see if you see, I mean, you should see a different signature if it starts in a localized state like this or in an extended state. Um, but this we didn't look into seeing what exactly these, these sort of signatures would be. Um, mostly because I think long before you tried doing spectroscopy on this, you would have a lot of other problems arranging these atoms at these short distances and everything. So you'd have to do all these experiments really at very high principal quantum numbers, and yeah, then things. But we should get talk difficult. because we can we can do n equals two hundred or That's something. That's what I heard. Yeah, yeah. So this this <laughs> wow. could be quite cool. <laughs> Huge numbers. Mm -hmm. Okay, so is it possible to characterize localization systematically in the thermodynamic limit, or it's not? Yeah, I would mm -hmm. say that's exactly what this participation ratio can do. So if you calculate this, an average over random disorder, and basically you can see if you are localizing or not based on how close this number is to two-thirds for at least a real valued wave function or how close it is to one over your system size. And what I didn't show is if you take, for example, the median of these or, or a state here in the edges and really plot the um, participation ratio as a function of n, you see that this scales like one over n. So essentially, as your system is growing, you're decreasing so that once it's infinity, you'll have one over infinity for the... the um, participation ratio, and this more or less translates into something like a localization length. And experimentally, how it is determined with localization length? Yeah, this would also so, be difficult. So yeah. you would have, <laughs> yeah, 
This I'm not sure. You would have to really know what your wave function is. I think this is generically a challenging thing. So you could think about doing some kind of transport measurement. If you could really think about, um, I don't know, observing dynamics of, of a system like this, if you prepare it in a localized state and come back and look at it later, it should still be in a localized state. So if this were possible, then you could really try to probe this. But I think this would be rather difficult. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> um, okay, let's thank once again for Matthew Addis. Yeah. Yeah.